Flying brings people together and contributes to a more harmonious world. You're less likely to go to war against a friend. On the other hand, flying has a large detrimental impact on the environment. So how can we marry the need for aviation to pollute less with our desire to discover places? Let's find out. Should flying be prohibited? This is the University of Flanders. We all know that aviation is very polluting, especially with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. Recent estimates place aviation's contribution to global warming at approximately three to five percent. And as more and more people are expected to, well, fly more and more, we can expect this contribution to also grow in the future. So to put these numbers into perspective, one trip from Brussels Zaventem to Singapore Changi Airport has a higher climate impact than that of three cars driving for the course of a full year on Belgian roads. And it has a higher climate impact than that of two households generating the heat and electricity for a full year. In other words, in order to make up for this one trip to Singapore, you would need to keep the car in the carport for three years and not use it or to live in cold and darkness for two years. So one could argue that by entering a plane, you basically become a co-conspirator to destroy our planet. However, if I were to ask now 100 random people on the street, if they were to make a promise on the spot to never ever fly again, not many of these people would make that promise. And I would not make it either. So why not? Why are we not willing to give up flying, although it is so polluting? If I were to ask this same group of people now as to why they are flying, why they're using the plane, I would get a multitude of reasons. And they would all boil down to the notion that aviation provides some benefits. And some of these benefits can relatively easily be quantified in monetary terms. The International Civil Aviation Organization estimates that aviation currently supports roughly 2.7 trillion US dollars in economic activity. That is 3.5% of global GDP and that it secures 65.6 million jobs. There are some local economies that are almost fully dependent on air travel related tourism. And these economies would be significantly poorer without the income generated by visitors arriving by plane. Some other benefits are harder to quantify in monetary terms. Aviation creates connectivity by bringing people actually together that usually are separated by both distance and culture. And this is important from a business perspective because it helps to truly engage with your business partners and to build trust that is very difficult to be built by, for example, a video conference. But this is also crucial and probably more importantly so from a broader societal perspective. Traveling broadens horizons by meeting and engaging with people and cultures that otherwise you would have never met. This is enriching in its own right, but it's also serving a broader purpose. Many of you will have heard about the European Student Exchange Program called Erasmus. And some of you might have even been part of it in the past or are part of it right now. Through the Erasmus Program, European students for the first time live and study in another European country. And the experiences that they have and the friendships that they make become a formative part of their lives. But besides the role that the Erasmus program plays for students themselves, Erasmus was actually set up decades ago as a program to promote democracy and peace in Europe. So to put it simply, a lot of prejudice and misconception about foreign cultures disappears once you immerse yourself in this culture and start making friends. And aviation plays the same role globally that Erasmus does for Europe. It turns strangers into friends and you're less likely to go to war against a friend than against a stranger. So in sum, 
Flying has many benefits, individually, for the economy, and actually also for society at large. So my bottom line is, if you were to prohibit flying, all these benefits would actually disappear. So prohibiting flying is not a feasible option. What we instead need is to develop solutions that marry the need for aviation to pollute less with our desire to fly. And now you might think that we should actually have a starting point for this because, well, there is the Paris Climate Agreement that provides a framework for limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees centigrade and for pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But the Paris Agreement actually only covers domestic aviation, so flights within one country from Munich to Frankfurt, for example, but not a flight from Frankfurt to Brussels or from Brussels to Chicago. That might seem odd, but the reason for this lies in the fact that the Paris Agreement rests upon countries reducing, well, their national emissions. But aviation emissions, well, happen in international airspace or in the airspace of other countries. So it is actually not known who would be responsible for reducing these emissions. However, obviously, even if International aviation is not part of the Paris Agreement. It is not acceptable to do nothing. So let's look at mitigation options for aviation's climate impact, starting with the aircraft itself. Each new aircraft generation is more fuel efficient and less greenhouse gas intensive than the previous one. For example, uh, the most novel aircraft that Airbus sells, the Airbus A350, burns roughly 30% less fuel per seat kilometer than an Airbus A340-300, which has been flying since the 1990s. However, it actually takes a long time to realize these emission savings throughout the full fleet, because airlines need to use the aircraft for 20 plus years because of the large investment needed to buy an aircraft. For example, the list price of one Boeing 787-900, the Boeing Dreamliner, lies currently at around 300 million US dollars. These high costs also imply that even if there was a major technological breakthrough that, for example, would mean that all electric flying was possible within the next 10 years or so, which would be a very ambitious timeline, it would still take until the year 2050 until the fleet was fully replaced with these green aircraft. There is also an ongoing effort to make well, the airspace more efficient. So currently, the airspace is fragmented because it is owned and operated by small national entities and parts of it are reserved for military use. For example, in China, roughly 80% of the airspace is for the military. So making the airspace more efficient would not be a game changer for the environmental impact of aviation, but it would lead to a reduction of a couple of percentage points with regard to the climate effects. Another active field of development are sustainable biofuels for aviation, using feedstocks such as agricultural residues, algae or waste oils. The benefit of biofuels stems from the fact that during fuel combustion, they release CO2 into the atmosphere that just recently was absorbed from the atmosphere by the growth of plants. Whereas traditional fuels made from crude oil release CO2 into the atmosphere that was sequestered millions of years ago and that therefore increase atmospheric CO2 concentrations. However, it is well known actually that traditional biomass feedstocks such as soybean or rapeseed or maize require additional land and that can have a negative impact, for example, with regard to food prices or with regard to emissions from land use change. Therefore, it is very important that aviation uses feedstocks that are actually sustainable, such as these egg residues, algae or waste oils. Road transportation biofuels, such as biodiesel or bioethanol, cannot be used in aviation, for example, because they're not safe. So we need new technologies specifically for aviation. You might have seen recently, well, airplanes with usually green stickers popping up saying that this airplane uses biokerosene. But in all fairness, the current use of this biokerosene 
lies at approximately 0.1% of current jet fuel usage. And that is because these fuels are currently two to 10 times more expensive than kerosene derived from crude oil. However, and that gives hope, as the aviation biofuel industry matures, well, the costs will decrease like they have for other renewable fuels. And once these fuels are available at large scale, they can immediately be used in the entire fleet without having to wait decades for the full benefits from emissions reductions to occur. Finally, and that brings us back to the policy arena. Even if international aviation is outside of Paris, there is actually already some sort of a CO2 emissions limit for international aviation in place. That cap has actually been imposed by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. And it means that the aviation sector has to offset all emissions growth occurring in international operations from the year 2021 onwards. What does offsetting mean? It means that for each ton of carbon dioxide that the aviation sector emits, in addition to what is currently emitted, it will need to pay someone else to reduce emissions by one ton of CO2. So, if I were to do now an additional trip from Brussels to Singapore, the airline would, to, would need to neutralize these additional greenhouse gas emissions by giving money to an organization or company for an emission savings project. So, for example, to plant some additional trees or to build an additional wind turbine. And key here is to ensure that these emissions savings projects are truly additional. In other words, that they would not have been undertaken without the airline paying for the offset. So the offsetting system might seem like the selling of indulgences, or in other words, like a cheap way for the aviation industry to avoid having to reduce emissions itself. But if it is set up properly and the environmental integrity is assured, it is actually an efficient way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because the climate system does not care about which sector of the economy reduces emissions by how much. It only cares about how much is being reduced in totality. And carbon offsetting is actually already possible for passengers on a voluntary basis. So you might have seen when you buy an airline ticket at the end of the booking process, this do you want to offset your carbon emissions button? And that button reflects the same idea that is now implemented for the airlines. But the passenger version is voluntary and currently less than 10% of all passengers offset their emissions. Which brings me back to what I said earlier. We are all aware of the negative climate consequences of flying, but not only are most of us not willing to give up flying, we're not even willing to voluntarily offset the environmental damages that we are causing. So clearly, voluntary measures are not the solution. The solution rather lies in a basket of measures with incentives for the large scale use of sustainable biofuels and the accelerated deployment of more efficient aircraft with more efficient use of the airspace and with a cap on emissions that gives the sector the flexibility to grow if it appropriately offsets its emissions. Such a basket of measures will help us to enjoy the benefits of flying without the detrimental impact that flying currently has on the environment. All these measures will likely mean that flying becomes more expensive. They will likely mean that the 39 euro ticket for a flight from Hamburg to Munich will disappear. But that is actually not a bad thing because it will help us think twice about using the plane for these short haul trips for which feasible transportation alternatives are actually available. So should flying be prohibited? No, but we have to act now to significantly reduce its environmental impact. And next time you fly, you should really think about voluntarily offsetting your CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm.